I'm going to be speaking to you today, and I got to give a lot of credit to my colleagues, both in the Chaplain Branch and elsewhere, for helping develop this particular presentation. I want to jump in and talk to you about 2005, an experience that I had while with 2PPCLI in Shiloh, Manitoba. On the eve of going into Kandahar, Roto 1, we brought in a particular general by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman to speak to soldiers about what they might experience during combat. I won't go into all the physiological things he said, but something that really caught my attention, particularly as a chaplain, was he started talking about thou shalt not kill. And he said an, an, an actual more accurate translation is thou shalt not murder. And then he proceeded to tell people that there's actually places in the Bible where God does not condemn those people who kill, especially in war and times of conflict. And then he went on to do his kind of hoorah stuff and get the troops all pumped up. And I can remember thinking after this formative event, what was he doing? Talking to a group of infanteers about the Bible in that context. And it wasn't until reflections years later that I realized he was doing a type of spiritual inoculation. He knew that the soldiers who were going into conflict would be asked to do things and, and they would experience things which were going to bring them, probably challenge them, their beliefs, their worldviews. And he wanted to give them a framework so that they could understand this. Spiritual resiliency, if you will. He was way ahead of his time in that. Now I'm not going to say that clearly he wasn't talking about spiritual resiliency and he wasn't the first person to ever do that. Spirituality has been around for thousands of years, but it hasn't been systematically studied, and there's a lot of reasons for that that I'm not going to get into. But clearly it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century, with work like Viktor Frankl and his Man's Search for Meaning and his Logotherapy, that something in the spiritual realm got within the social sciences to be studied. Maslow also had something to do with this, especially with his love and belonging, again was looked at systematically within the social sciences. And after that, a slight change in the definition of spirituality such that it wasn't always connected to that R word, religion. Once that disconnect came, then the studies and the official way of looking at spirituality scientifically took off. Now, I am not going to go into all the different ways that spirituality has been studied, other than to let you know that it in fact has been studied and that it is positively linked to well-being and resilience. We can discuss perhaps in other forms how that is so. One of the things that is important, however, to note, oh, I'm going the wrong way. There are metrics as well for spirituality, and I'm going to say words like point to suggest that because a lot of these metrics, even though like the spiritual well-being scale have been around since 1982, others like the TCI, the Temperament and Character Inventory, which was spoke about yesterday, these metrics have been around, but are they valid? Are they reliable? That is a question that's always been out there and we haven't completely solved it yet. But as, and I was so happy to hear General Rouleau speak about this topic, because you could tell that spirituality within the soft world is something that rolls off his tongue, where most people tend to avoid the word spirituality. It doesn't just roll off the tongue. The fact that it rolled off his tongue, and he's saying that this is kind of the future operating environment, so the, the forces, the army of the Canadian forces today can look to that for our future, the fact that it rolls off his tongue means that they see it having value and it's socialized there. So I think that's the future for us. Some more spirituality indicators. And it's always good to have numbers because a lot of the uh, spirituality metrics and studies are in the social sciences and thus uh, individual reporting mechanisms, so it's sometimes good to have some of the, the numbers associated. So you're looking at a slide with spirituality, forgiveness, and quality of life, and correlations. I don't want to go too much into outside the Canadian forces because I don't have time. However, I want everyone to realize that the progression, so the studies of 
and about spirituality and how it came into the social sciences. And then that evolution brought it into our American colleagues who looked at spirituality and the value it could bring in terms of resilience. So we have this Project Air Force by RAND, and they looked at four constructs which they thought were indicative of spirituality within the Air Force, and those were particularly uh, spiritual coping mechanisms, spiritual community support, spiritual worldview, and I believe also, where are we here? Spiritual witness, rituals and practices. And these were connected, not surprisingly, to quality of life and general well-being, but what was really interesting was they also, especially spiritual worldview, had a connection to buffering against stress. And the fact that spirituality has a tangible health benefit is something that the forces could really get into, and that's why it's growing so much. The U.S. Uh, Army, with their comprehensive soldier fitness program, has four dimensions, as was mentioned before. That's the familial, the social, the emotional, and the spiritual. And they have a global assessment tool, which they are using. It's a self-reporting inventory, which they are using to govern how people are doing in these domains. And I thought it'd be really interesting if we in the Canadian Forces went down this path. Because what you do, if my understanding of this, and please correct me later if I'm incorrect, but my understanding, if you don't do so well in one of these metrics, you get to do a little bit of basic training. And I thought, wonder how we'd experience it in the Canadian forces if you, we developed a spiritual domain, and we had a metric, and it said, hey, you're not doing so well spiritually. I think it's time for you to do some extra spiritual training. I wonder how that would go over. The Canadian forces, we, of course, have taken that on. We've taken the, uh, the bit, if you will, from our American colleagues, the GGMPRA has looked at spiritual well-being and wellness, and in true Canadian fashion, we wanted to make sure that we were inclusive so that no one was offended, and we wanted to make sure everyone knew that when we're talking about spirituality, we don't just mean religion. Clearly, religion is connected in some cases, but not always. I want to also point out how the GGMPRA wanted to make sure that people knew when we were talking about religion, there were seven different aspects of it which they wanted to describe so we would all be on the same page. In the Canadian Army, we moved into the Canadian Army Integrated Performance Strategy. Again, something brought up by Major General Lange from the United States. We already talked about those domains. The spiritual domain was given, if you will, to the Canadian, the Royal Canadian Chaplain Service to lead. With this particular caveat or warning from Major General Lange, he said, hey, I want you to lead this and develop this, but make sure that you include in your definition of spirituality something that the entire army can buy into. That is quite the challenge. So you'll see the definition which we developed for the CAPES program which has been adopted by the Center for the Spiritual Wellness Strategy for the entire force. And you'll see that it encapsulates uh, meaning, beliefs, values, and transcendence, something that's common to most definitions of spirituality. One of the challenges, of course, is that spirituality does not have a single definition. And so every group that works on spirituality kind of has their own little nuances, and it makes it difficult to study. I want to show you Oh, wrong way again. You'd think with the big green button I would have got it by now. Spiritual fitness, I wanted to show you because it's also, when we're talking about spirituality, really important for everyone to be on the same page. So here's the definition of spiritual fitness that we're working on. The spiritual fitness performance continuum. This is not a diagnostic tool, but it is something for everyone to look at and say, hey, where am I spiritually? Am I healthy? I'm in the green. Am I starting to experience some difficulty? Am I moving into the orange and red? And if you are moving into those areas, maybe you should talk to someone. Maybe you should reach out to a clinician or a chaplain for some exploration. I don't need to speak too much to this other than to let everyone know that spiritual resiliency is one of the main pillars right now of the Royal Canadian Chaplain Service. And to that end, 
they have developed a great deal of programming to help address this for our forces. If we're going to do that, however, we need to understand what spiritual resiliency is, and there's a definition that we use. And the great thing about this definition where, as in the past times, it used to be just being able to bounce back from difficulty or adversity, now we're looking at being able to thrive. And because of that, I decided I would develop categories of defensive and offensive spirituality. And by defensive spirituality, I'm meaning those things which are going to enable us to bounce back from difficulty spiritually. And by offensive, those things which, regardless of the problems in your life, these are things which are going to help us be happier, healthier, whole individuals. Defensive spirituality. Programs developed by the Canadian Forces Chaplains. Chaplaincy. This year, we, spent we sent 54 people to the Lord's military pilgrimage over in Paris. Or over in France, sorry. Now, we haven't got all our metrics back. One of the key forces, one of the things that, that the Canadian Forces Chaplaincy, like other groups, has been challenged to do is figure out how we're going to measure this. So we have spirituality metrics which are now coming back. One of the evaluations, one of the people put this. During this pilgrimage, I was able to feel at peace and calm, which they haven't felt in years. This is the starting of a journey of healing for them. Lieutenant Colonel, Reverend Dr. Claude Pigeon, looked at pilgrimages in general and found that this is incredibly important for meaning and for healing for people. And pilgrimages allow people to go on this individual search for meaning that is at once both individual and collective because there's other people searching. And this is incredibly important for people's development, healing, and meaning making. The Sentinel program, which developed in the Army and is now going calf-wide, is spiritual in that it is about the ethos of the Canadian forces, about us loving and caring for each other. It's a peer program. Moral injury has been a concept that has been tossed about, and there's a definition at the first of this. But what is interesting, thus far, moral injury has resisted therapeutic techniques into how to treat it. And this new openness we have to spirituality and its study is now allowing us to look at how we can maybe address something like moral injury using the language of belief and meaning. One of our most recent graduates from St. Paul University in counseling specifically addressed spirituality. And one of the things that was talked about yesterday, it's not just being able to help people bounce back, but there is um, being able to thrive after trauma, traumatic, post-traumatic growth. And that's something that can be got at because, again, of this openness to spirituality and this development and inclusiveness of spirituality as something that can be studied and its link to the health and wellness fields. I didn't realize when I developed this presentation the different ways that you could take offensive. <laughs> we'll see which way you take it after this presentation is over. We realize that a lot of our people who are coming in the Canadian Forces do not have a spirituality or religious language at all. They've never been exposed to it. So it became important at the Canadian Forces Recruitment School to have a spirituality 101 course to introduce the concepts of spirituality. Some people have great spiritual coping mechanisms, but if you don't realize that you have them, if you don't name them, that reduces their effectiveness. So we wanted to make sure that at their initial stage when they enter into the forces that people get this. This is one of the slides that they will see, and it shows the overlap of all these domains because clearly spirituality doesn't exist in a vacuum. The Warrior Spiritual Resiliency Program, taught by Padre Vic Morris out in Wainwright, he is doing his PhD currently on spirituality. And he, can, he used this developing on the initial package done at the recruiting school, but it's specifically for the Army and developing how the controlled use of violence is going to be able to be compatible with your spirituality. How is it that meaning and belief is going to be compatible potentially with killing? And he went into that whole, uh, for those of you who know Grossman, when that whole, we are the sheepdogs who protect the sheep from the wolves that are out there. But helping to understand who we are as people in the forces and be able to 
rationalize that with who we are as spiritual beings. Ken Sofcom was spoke about brilliantly this morning by General Rouleau, so I don't have to go into that, and that's good because everything is, oh, sorry. Uh, everything is essentially classified, which, which is unfortunate because as I would have liked to share a lot about that, they did in Ken Sofcom find the meaning of life and the purpose of everything, but they weren't allowed to share it with us here. <laughs> Within CAT-TC, I work on religious leader engagement with Padre Al Nichol and religious area analysis. What is interesting, those aren't spiritual programs per se, but the offshoot of this is that we're feeding information back into the center, the CAF, about the religious beliefs and meaning for all those environments that we are going into. And because of that, it tends to humanize those people we're going into, and that humanizing, as opposed to the dehumanizing, which was considered normative before, keeps people from transgressing their values, which has the added benefit of not allowing them to do things which would contravene who they are and thus protect them from, or at least better inoculate them against moral injury. Just a little shameless plug for a... Um, our CHS, the Royal Canadian Chaplain Service, a little booklet we put out on spiritual uh, resiliency, where are we spiritually, so a, a self-reference guide. And one thing that Dr. Risto, a chaplain in the Canadian Forces, did, which was incredibly important, he did some work on just having a chaplaincy. Having people that have faith, where is my, <laughs> faith identifies crosses, crescent moons, tablets. People who ask you questions about What's the purpose of all this? What's the meaning? What do you believe? Just the presence of chaplains gets people to consider this about why they're doing what they're doing. What is the purpose of it all has incredible resiliency value. What does the future hold for spirituality? Dr. Suzette Grimaud Phillips has been looking at how all of these new programs in the Canadian forces are going to align so she looked at the CAPES program, the well-being strategy in the center, and the VAC domains, and she's looked at a way to align those all. And if you'll see right in the center in this blurry diagram, spirituality she sees, meaning making, values and beliefs as right at the center, at the core. Dr. Risto, Major Lucas, they talked about how the studies right now are indicating, again, not proven, but indicating that spiritual resiliency increases ethical decision making and that it seems that increased spiritual fitness will contribute to the readiness and resiliency of the forces. So clearly, as uh, General Lowe was talking about, there is a future for this. We have to look at how we're going to develop this. But what of the super soldier? Is there a way that spirituality is implicated in the development of the super soldier? And I want to present to you this as my closing comments. Dr. Harold Koenig in 2012 said rather controversially, almost in admiration, that the Islamic terrorists are upheld despite the fact that they are less resourced than their adversaries. They're upheld and they're able to thrive and be resilient because of the strength of their belief system and their religious convictions. Now, I'm not going to advocate that in, within the Canadian forces we have religious extremists run around. But if we combine that with the work of Scott Appleby, who talked about strong religion, strong religion being a religion that is connected to and appreciates other faith groups, that it has checks and balances. Strong religion is one that has recognized religious leaders who are accredited. So if we connect that work, because that, people who have strong religion, is not only associated with resiliency, but it is associated with finding tremendous value and meaning and happiness in life. So if you connect those two things, could it be that the super soldier is one who has a religious belief system and is able not to just bounce back from things, but able to thrive? And while we can't impose a religion on the Canadian Army, Perhaps with recruiting, we will actually focus our efforts at going out those communities 
who have strong religion and recruiting from those because we know those people who have strong religious conviction and strong what Appleby would call strong religion will be able to thrive in the Canadian forces and lead spiritually even the most austere and difficult circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention.